Hello and welcome to News Tonight on Rajasabha TV where we bring you the day's biggest stories and put them in perspective for you. I'm Ashwarya Kapoor. Let us begin with the headlines. The Indian Air Force gets its first women fighter pilots Bhavna Kant, Avni Chaturvedi and Mohanna Singh create history by being commissioned. Prime Minister Narendra Modi inaugurates stadium in war-torn Jaffna, also promises stronger bilateral ties with Sri Lanka. RBI Governor Raghuram Rajan says no to a second term, writes letter to staff expressing his desire to return to academia. Iraqi army finally completes the takeover of Islamic state-controlled Fallujah. Concerns now arise for trapped civilians. And IIAF uh, upholds suspension on Russian athletes. No clarity yet on whether they can participate in Rio Olympics. Well, the biggest story, flying cadets Bhavna Kant, Avni Chaturvedi and Mohan Singh have created history by becoming the first women pilots to be commissioned in the Indian Air Force. The trio will now undergo advanced training for one year before they finally enter into a fighter cockpit in June 2017 to fly supersonic warplanes. Defence Minister Manohar Parikhar termed it a milestone. It was a defining moment in the history of the Indian Air Force as the first ever batch of three women fighter jet pilots were commissioned. Avni Chaturvedi, Bhavna Kant and Mohana Singh became the first women fighter pilots to be formally commissioned by the Indian Air Force. Obviously, we are feeling quite fortunate for being the first ones. Anybody could have got that opportunity but we got it and we are happy about it. Before going solo in the aircraft, we have been trained a lot with the instructors. We have been cleared by the I'm an examiner, so we feel confident, we feel good definitely because flying solo an aircraft gives you a special feeling. Definitely it's a good feeling and uh, we feel privileged and quite lucky the first one. It could be anyone, it's our luck that we are the one. Defence Minister Manohar Parikar, who was present at the event, called it a golden letter day for the Indian Air Force. We consider that there should be total gender parity in armed forces. Now, while I say this, there are technical administrative difficulties which we are likely to, likely to face in certain areas. So, step by step, we will see that this parity is uh, achieved. The women who broke the barriers to each their names have cleared the first stage of training with about 150 hours of flying. They will now be trained on the advanced jet fighter, the British built Hawk, for a year before being finally allowed to fly supersonic warplanes. It's a very proud moment, especially for me and of course for the whole nation for that matter, that uh, three very bright young ladies are joining uh, the fighter stream. Where they will be uh, flying the Hawk trainer, advanced jet trainer, to practice all those exercises which are operational squadron aircraft and pilots do, uh, whether it is tactical, low level, high level, combat, whatever the things are, group combat, all these things they will be introduced to. Women pilots have been flying helicopters and transport aircraft since 1991 in the Indian Air Force, but it was only last year that the government decided to allow them into fighter jet cockpits. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, moving on in a bid to strengthen bilateral ties with its neighbour, India today inaugurated a sports stadium in Sri Lanka's Jaffna. Now, the stadium in the war-torn region has been renovated by India. Recently, India had also inaugurated the Friendship Dam in Afghanistan, built with the help of the country. Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Sri Lankan President Maitripala Sirisena jointly inaugurated a stadium in Jaffna on Saturday. The Prime Minister joined in for the Durayapa Stadium's inauguration via video conferencing. The stadium has been renovated by India. While Sirisena was present at the Durayapa Stadium, External Affairs Minister Sushma Swaraj and Foreign Secretary S. Jay Shankar accompanied the Prime Minister in New Delhi. 
Modi assured Sri Lanka that India would walk side by side with the country as it charts its path to progress and prosperity. Our relations are not limited to the confines of our two governments. They reside in the rich context of our history, culture, language, art and geography. India strongly believes that its economic growth must drive and bring benefits to its neighbors. Dureyappa Stadium embodies the spirit of our cooperation. Renovated at a cost of over 7 crore rupees, the stadium, named after the former mayor of Jaffna, was unoperational for nearly 20 years. It has a seating capacity of over 1,800 and will provide the basic infrastructure to promote sports and recreational activities in the region. President Sirisena thanked the Indian government and said that Sri Lanka was committed to strengthening bilateral relations. Visheshema Sadahan Kana Tone Operate Sangwardane Sadaha Dirga Kalino India India Raja Saha Yoga Levila Tibino. Both leaders also witnessed the second International Yoga Day celebrations at the renovated stadium where thousands of students performed the ancient Indian discipline. Bureau Report, Raja Sabha TV. Well, on to the other big story of the day, Raghuram Rajan, the RBI governor, will return to academia when his current term ends on 4th of September. Now, in a letter to the central bank staff, Rajan said that he would not like a second term in office. The RBI posted uh, Rajan's message on its website. In the letter, Rajan says, and I quote him, I am an academic and have always made it clear that my ultimate home is in the realm of ideas. While all of what we laid out on that first day is done, two subsequent developments are yet to be completed. While I was open to seeing these developments through, on due reflection and after consultation with the government, I want to share with you that I will be returning to academia when my term as the governor ends on 4th of September 2016. I will of course uh, always be available to serve my country when needed. The RBI governor also talked about the work done over the last three years and how he has worked with the government in bringing about economic changes. Rajan uh, sounded particularly enthusiastic about uh, the inflation-focused framework that uh, has helped uh, half the inflation and also allowed the savers to earn positive real interest rates. Now, there has been speculation about uh, Rajan's second term ever since BJP MP Subramanyam Swami wrote a letter to Prime Minister Narendra Modi last month urging him not to extend his tenure. Moving on, uh, well, India and uh, South Korea jointly reviewed their uh, free trade agreement today to boost trade and investment ties. The review meeting was attended by Commerce and Industry Minister Nirmala Sitharaman and her South Korean counterpart, Hyung Wan Ju. Concerned over a widening uh, trade deficit uh, with uh, South Korea, India sought uh, greater market access in sectors such as agriculture, marine, IT and healthcare in the East Asian nation. The issue, among others, was discussed at the review meeting of India-South Korea Free Trade Agreement, officially known as the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement or the CEPA. Well, it was the second meeting of the Joint Committee at the ministerial level to review CEPA. And Home Minister Rajnath Singh is in Bilaspur today as part of Vikas Park, which is being celebrated all over the country on the completion of two years of the NDA government. Now addressing a large crowd, the Home Minister spoke of the achievements of the government and said that Prime Minister Modi has brought an overall image makeover for India. Earlier, Singh attended a beneficiary function at a school and a BJP party workers' congregation as well. <laughs> Well, weather update now in uh, southwest monsoon entered Bihar, Odisha and West Bengal with rains drenching parts of uh, all the three states. Well, according to the Met Department, heavy rains are predicted in Bihar, West Bengal, Odisha, Vidarbha, Chhattisgarh, Telangana, Karnataka and Kerala tomorrow. 
Bihar's northeastern parts also received rains, while the monsoon is expected to advance to other areas in the next three to four days. Heavy rains also lashed Kerala and Lakshadweep, with the several houses suffering damage and trees getting uprooted at many places. Now, Kerala will be holding a flood management mock drills in 15 districts tomorrow. In North India, Amritsar also received the season's first rainfall, sending temperature down by several notches. However, hot and humid weather continues to trouble residents in Delhi. The city reported a maximum temperature of 39.5 degrees Celsius, while the minimum temperature was recorded at 25.8 degrees. Humidity was between 45 and 86 percent. Let's also take a look at what else is making news around the country nationwide. Karnataka Chief Minister Siddhar Amaya is all set to reshuffle his cabinet after he received a green signal from the party high command. The exercise is being undertaken to tone up the government after Congress's debacle in recent assembly polls in four states, especially the state of Assam. He said that the list will be prepared in a day or two and will be submitted to the governor. The three-day meeting of uh, the Central Committee of the CPIM began in Delhi on Saturday. The highest decision-making body of the left-front constituent is meeting for the first time after the recent assembly polls. Members are expected to discuss uh, the party's performance in the assembly polls in four states and a union territory. There will be special focus on the alliance so with the Congress in West Bengal. The party did not do well in the state even as it uh, posted a resounding win in the state of Kerala. The Jammu and Kashmir government has restored the broadband internet services in the state less than 12 hours after its suspension. However, mobile internet services continue to remain suspended for the third day today. The state had been witnessing violence and tension after two temples in the state were disrupted. The government is exploring the feasibility of a contract farming of pulses in African nations. Now a delegation may visit Mozambique and examine the possibility of the project. Mozambique, Tanzania and Malawi are the three prospective destinations in this regard. The government is looking for a long-term solution to domestic shortage and high prices. Dutch beer major Heineken filed an application before the Debt Recovery Tribunal seeking to be impleted in the Vijay Malia case. Now, Heineken has some presumptive rights on Union Breweries Limited shares that were held and owned by Malia. The company is seeking to enjoy the right of first refusal over UBL shares. News tonight will take a very short break. We'll be back with more news. Stay with us. Welcome to this episode of Eureka. We are with us, Dr. Kiran Kumar. While the target was 22, two of the satellites from one of the customers, last minute they had to drop out because certain tests which they were doing, mm -hmm. they did not succeed in mm -hmm. that. So they have to, we will be giving them an opportunity in a later launch. Okay. So far we have done about 21 countries. Okay. For different 21 countries we have launched the satellite. 57 is our last number. With this, it will become 57 plus another 70. 70. Watch Eureka with Dr. A.S. Kiran Kumar, Chairman ISRO, only on Rajya Sabha TV. Welcome back. Now, the U.S. Congress has expressed a concern over no substantial economic reforms in India, despite the government's bilateral engagement with the country. Now, in its report, the Research Service Wing of the U.S. Congress has observed that two years into the Modi administration, many U.S. policymakers are concerned that neither the Indian government's rhetoric nor bilateral engagement has led to substantial, sustained economic reforms in India, superseding earlier optimism about the likelihood of expanding Indo-U.S. commercial ties. However, the report was optimistic about the Indo-U.S. defense cooperation and said U.S.-India security cooperation has blossomed in the 21st century despite a concurrent U.S. military alliance with India's rival Pakistan. Now, CRS is an independent research wing of the U.S. Congress that prepares periodic reports on issues of interest for the lawmakers to take informed decisions. This is, however, not an official report of the Congress. 
And uh, Thailand's Prime Minister Prayuth Chan O Cha today visited Buddhism's uh, holiest shrine at uh, Bodh Gaya in Bihar after concluding his official engagements in New Delhi. Now, the temple uh, monks uh, greeted uh, Chan O Cha with a holy robe and held special prayers there. The Thai Prime Minister was on a three day visit to India from 16th of June and has now left for Bangkok. Now, during his visit to India, both India and uh, Thailand signed two agreements on culture and education after delegation-level talks between the two sides. Both uh, Chan Ocha and Prime Minister Narendra Modi also spoke about a stronger connectivity between the two nations. Thai Prime Minister also called on Vice President Mohammad Hamid Ansari on Friday. Both the leaders discussed bilateral and regional ties besides global issues. On to the big international story now, and Iraq is now in the control uh, of Fallujah city center. Having claimed it from the clutches of the Islamic State, the army says that Islamic State will suffer a total breakdown in the next few hours. However, the claim of victory has uh, shifted the focus uh, to 50,000 civilians who are still trapped in the combat zone. <laughs> قواتنا البطلة على قضاء الفلوجة وأحكمت سيطرتها على داخل المدينة. Iraq declaring full control of the city of Fallujah. The country's prime minister declaring the city free for most parts from the grip of the Islamic State militants. This came after fierce clashes broke out across Fallujah on Friday. The announcement comes nearly four weeks after the start of a U.S.-backed offensive to liberate the Islamic State's last major foothold in Iraq's Anbar province. The Iraqi army says they are now attempting to allow the Islamic State militants a path out of the city to avoid heavy fighting in built-up areas. Meanwhile, there is still no immediate information about thousands of civilians still trapped in central Fallujah in dire conditions. Islamic State militants are reported to have used residents as human shields to slow the advance of government forces and limit airstrikes by US-led coalition. It is estimated that while about 20,000 people have fled since IS fighters began retreating on Thursday, several were killed while attempting to flee. If the city has indeed been taken over by Iraq, it would represent a significant blow to the militant group. Being a mere 50 kilometers west of Baghdad, it will also relieve some pressure on the Iraqi capital. Prime Minister Al Abadi says his forces will next march on Mosul. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. And on to the other big international story. Well, an Egyptian court has handed down a life sentence to the country's uh, former president, Mohamed Mursi, in an espionage case for le leaking a state secrets to Qatar. The court also confirmed the death sentences of six of Morsi's co-defendants in the case, including three journalists of Al Jazeera. Now, Morsi was given an additional 15 years in prison in the same case, increasing his uh, jail term to 40 years. The sentences are the latest in a crackdown on the Muslim Brotherhood since an army takeover power in 2013 following mass protests. Prosecutors argued Morsi and his aides were involved in leaking sensitive information to Qatar intelligence that exposed the location of weapons held by the Egyptian armed forces. However, all of the defendants can now appeal the verdicts to the Egyptian Court of Cassation, which is the country's highest civil court. More international news now, here is the Global Buzz. A militant who was arrested for carrying out a failed assassination attempt on a Hindu lecturer in Bangladesh was killed in a shootout on Saturday. Police said Fazullah Fahim's group members fired gunshots as he was guiding the police to their hideout and that he died in the crossfire. Fahim was arrested in connection with a murder attempt on Ripan Chakrabati, a lecturer of uh, the Government University College in Madaripur in Bangladesh. 
The U.S. House of Representatives has rejected by two by vote two amendments uh, to cut Washington's assistance for Pakistan. While debating the Annual Defense Appropriation Act for the financial year 2017, two congressmen had moved an amendment to cut the coalition support fund for Pakistan from $900 million to $700 million, while another had submitted a separate amendment calling for ending all the assistance for Pakistan. But all the amendments were rejected. Police in Belgium have made 12 arrests in a huge anti-terror operation nearly three months after the deadly bomb attacks on Brussels. Now, those detained are suspected of plotting a terrorist attack. Searches were conducted in 16 municipalities, mainly around Brussels. On the 22nd of March, bombs killed 32 people at a Brussels airport and a metro station. The man charged with the murder of Labour MP Joe Cox appeared in court today and has been remanded in custody. Thomas Mayer gave his name as a death to traitors, freedom for Britain when he appeared at the Westminster's Magistrates Court. Member of Parliament Cox was shot and stabbed in Burstall in West Yorkshire on Thursday. The main crossing along Afghanistan's disputed border with Pakistan reopened on Saturday after nearly a week of deadly clashes between the two nations. The fighting, which has killed at least four people, erupted at Torkham Gate after two sides disagreed over a Pakistani plan to build a new barrier at the crossing. Now, officials on both sides said that the crossing had reopened after Kabul and Islamabad reached an agreement. And on to some cricket news now. Well, Zimbabwe shocked India in the first T20 at Harare, beating the visitors by two runs. Now put into bat first, the hosts were propelled by Iton Chin Gumbarara's 50 as they reached a healthy total of 170 in their allotted 20 overs. Now India's chase got off to the worst possible start as they lost to KL Rahul on the very first ball. The visitors, however, kept up over the chase that despite losing wickets at regular intervals, with the captain MS Dhoni on the crease, India needed eight runs off the last over and four runs off the last ball. But some good bowling by Madziva saw India fell two run short of the target. And the prospect of the Rio Olympics uh, without Russian track and field athletes looks a clear possibility now after the athletics uh, world governing body IAAF upheld its suspension of the Russian athletes. Now, in a unanimous vote in Vienna, the IIA IAAF upheld the ban following accusations of state-sponsored doping. Russia's only hope now is IOC, which will meet to discuss the issue on Tuesday. World Athletics Governing Body, IAAF, has upheld its doping ban on all Russian athletes, rendering the country's hopes of competing in the Rio Olympics bleak. The Council of International Association of Athletics Federations voted unanimously to extend the ban after hearing from a task force that significant doping problems still existed in Russia. Although good progress has been made, the IAAF Council was unanimous that RUSAF had not met the reinstatement conditions and that Russian athletes could not credibly return to international competition without undermining the confidence of their competitors and the public. As a result, RUSAF has not been reinstated to membership of the IAAF at this stage. Russian President Vladimir Putin has called the ban unjust and unfair. Putin said the wholesale ban on Russian athletes rather than individuals was unfair and it did not fit into any framework of civilized behavior. Russian Russia's hopes of competing in Rio are now at the mercy of the International Olympic Committee which will meet in Lausanne on Tuesday. It's an international federation's right to um, suspend a national federation and I don't think we would um, overturn that at all. I'd be very surprised. Russia was suspended by the IAAF in November 2015 
after an independent World Anti-Doping Association report revealed widespread state-sponsored doping. Following the revelation, Russia introduced reforms, including an overhaul of the rules, but a fresh WADA report issued on Wednesday made more damaging claims, including 52 failed tests since. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Let's get you some more sporting action now. Here is the sports beat. India had to settle for silver in the Champions Trophy hockey after losing 1-3 to Australia in the penalty shootout. The match remained goalless in regulation time with both sides missing several chances. Australian goalkeeper Tyler Lovell then denied SK Tappa, SP Sunil and Surinder Kumar in the penalty shootout to drive Australia to their 14th Champions Trophy title. Romelu Lukaku's brace on either side of Axel Witzel goal saw off Republic of Ireland as Belgium got their Euro 2016 challenge back on track with a 3-0 victory. Belgium had been placed among the favourites heading into the finals but lost their opener to Italy. In Copa America, Colombia advanced to the semi-finals after beating Peru in the penalty shootout. The quarter-final remained goalless in the 90th minutes and extra time. In the shootout, Arsenal goalkeeper David uh, Ospina was the hero as Colombia stayed their penalty shootout jinx to make it to the last four. In tennis, uh, Swiss top seed Roger Federer defeated Belgium's uh, David Goffin 6-1, 7-6 to reach the semi-finals of the Halle Grass Court tournament. The 17-time Grand Slam winner who is seeking a ninth title in Wimbledon warm-up event and fourth in succession at the tournament will next play Alexander Zverev in the last four. That's all in this edition of News Tonight. Thanks for watching. Good night.